First of all, let me just say what an honor it is to be speaking here today, and thank you to SACNAS for your support and for the invitation. I am queer, and I'm a biologist. Y soy de la frontera. Growing up in the borderlands of Texas, I didn't know a lot of things. I didn't know what it was like to be living outside of a predominantly Hispanic community. I didn't really know what it was like to be away from nature. Nature was my companion. Here, here I am just to prove it. But there was a lot of things that I did know. I knew what it was like to come up against expectations that were not the way that I felt, what represented me. I was a tomboy, I still am, and I couldn't quite understand why I couldn't do what all the other boys on the schoolyard were doing. It seemed like something that should be an ability that I could have. And I think that part of that reason is represented in this map right here. As I grew up and realized that I was a queer and eventually realized that I was a scientist, I was faced with a problem. And that problem is that still today in 28 states, including this one, I am not protected because of that fact for my employment. I can be fired tomorrow because of being a queer. But luckily, I live in San Francisco. <laughs> which arguably is the gayest city in the US. And we're very protected for being gender non-conforming or being gay or being lesbian or whatever our identity is, we cannot be fired because of our sexual orientation. I have hope for Texas. I believe that this is not a problem that is just a STEM problem. This is a problem that is a national problem. But we as scientists, because of our work and the nature of it as collaborative, can take a big step forward in ensuring that this changes. I want to talk a little bit about some of the underlying problems. And let's start with undergraduates. Undergraduates that are non-gender conforming, that is transgender or gender neutral students, report the highest on-campus sexual assault and misconduct of any other single group. 60% of LGBTQ students on college campuses here in the United States report incidences of sexual misconduct or harassment. And for me, one of the most appalling figures is the last one, which is that students that are LGBT are 8% less likely to stay in STEM than their heterosexual counterparts, but are more likely to have participated in research in a laboratory, which is usually a strong indicator of persistence in the STEM pipeline. But the problem doesn't stop at the undergraduate level. It's really something persistent on all levels of college campuses. A recent survey which was the first survey of LGBT scientists and professionals, found that 40% of respondents in STEM fields are not out to their colleagues. A similar study, which surveyed only STEM professionals that were working at the faculty level on college campuses, found that 69% of faculty that are out are uncomfortable in their university department. They've been made to feel isolated or excluded by their colleagues. And this is not just a problem within academia. 
A recent American Chemical Society survey found that 44% of their respondents, working both in industry and in with, within academia, felt excluded, intimidated, or harassed at work. And this is not only a problem for those people that are LGBT, it's a problem for all of us. Because when our faculty and our students feel uncomfortable in the place where they're studying or working, they're less productive, they're worse mentors, and they're less likely to persist in the STEM pipeline. And that's damaging, because as we all in this room know, the greater amount of perspectives present and represented in our STEM fields, the better job we're going to do in advancing science and technology. The American Physical Society recently did a study on the climate for LGBT people working in physics. And what they found really echoes that found by other surveys and similar kinds of studies, which is that essentially a heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM work environments is persistent on our college campuses. So I, for one, wasn't going to take this sitting down. I live in San Francisco, as I mentioned, the gayest city in America, and I'm the only queer faculty member in my institution. And that, I think, is problematic. I felt isolated. I don't know any other queers when I go to conferences. Well, this one excluded, because if anything about the LGBT mixer tells me from last night, there are plenty of LGBT students here at SOCNAS. So in June of this year, I made a statement. I decided that I was going to start a visibility campaign. Now, granted, I don't know what a visibility campaign means. I am not an activist, or at least I wasn't four months ago. I don't know how to run a successful social media campaign. I had a Twitter account, but I can't say I was particularly good at Twitter. So I enlisted some friends who are social media experts, asked them for some guidance, and told them about this crazy plan that I had. So in June, for Pride Month, I launched 500 Queer Scientists, a visibility campaign to raise awareness of LGBT people working in STEM and STEM supporting careers. And my goal was simple. I wanted people not to feel alone. So I started with a single post. I'm queer, I'm an arachnologist, and I'm here. And pretty soon, it wasn't just a single post. It was 50 posts. And then 50 posts grew to 200. And then by the end of that month, those 200 had grown to our namesake, 500 queer scientists, which was modeled after the idea of 500 women scientists that came about a couple of years ago. Thank you. And I didn't really know what to expect. I wasn't sure if this community was going to come about and discuss all the trials and tribulations that we're going through and how hard it is to be queer in STEM. But what I found was that people were just excited. People were so happy to meet other queers and other LGBTQAI and all of the other letters that were working in STEM at all sorts of levels in their career, like this one, who said that they'd never met any LGBT faculty until they started grad school, and still wondered if they were doing the right thing following this career path. Or this one, where a student was thanking a mentor, and the mentor was admitting that they had the courage to do this because of the visibility of other scientists. So now we're four months in. We have, as of yesterday, 450 contributors. Four, I mean, sorry, 750 co contributors. So that's 750 people who are LGBTQ 
who are scientists, and that is remarkable. They're willing to tell their story and they're willing to be public. We've also just recently added a bilingual submission form to our page, so now we're Spanish and English 500 queer scientists. So the last thing I want to touch on is how to be an ally, because the statistics say that 10% of the people sitting in this room are LGBT, but there's a whole lot of us in this room, and that's a whole lot of room for potential allies. There's a few small steps that you can take to be a good ally. The first is your use of pronouns. How many of you guys have ever thought about your pronouns before? I'm guessing 20%. Yeah, okay, that seems about right. If you've never thought about your pronouns, that's because you've never had to. The pronouns that you use to describe yourself are the same as those that you were given at birth. But for a large number of people, that's not true. Or in the case of somebody like myself, who might read as not being a female or not being a woman, it's confusing what to many people what they should call me. Just this morning, I was called sir in the elevator, which is fine, I accept it. I look like a boy, it's okay, I'm used to it. But the use of pronouns publicly helps people feel comfortable in the public recognizing their identity. So if there's one thing that you do after this talk, it's take your name badge out of the plastic and write at the bottom the pronouns that you prefer to use. Because if one person does it, it's, you, it's unusual. If everybody does it, it's normal. The next thing is use gender neutral language when you talk. Use the words they and them. For many of us that speak English, that feels uncomfortable because they and them is something that's plural. But it's the gender neutral pronoun that has been identified by the community as that of preference. So use they and them. It's great for LGBT scientists. It's also great for women that we're not using he and him all the time. The last thing is, I, I, this, this is a lot of text, and I'm gonna read it, but in case you can't hear me well, I wanted to put it up on the screen. People ask how to be a good ally, and I would say that I started 500 Queer Scientists, and if this was the only thing that had resulted from that campaign, I would feel like I, it was a success. This is a letter that was written to a faculty member after they posted a bio on 500 Queer Scientists, and it was written by the dean, and it reads, Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to let you know that I saw you were publicly identifying as non-binary. That means not either as a man or a woman. And to assume that you have, to assure you that you have my support. I also wanted to check in on whether there are any changes you would like me to make in the way that I or the team talks to you or refers to you, i.e. name or pronouns, or anything else that will help affirm your identity. Finally, Please, let me, please know that you can come to me with any frustrations or concerns related to this or anything else. You're a great scientist, and I'm proud to have you on the team. And this is how you be a good ally. The last thing I'd like to say is if you'd like to read the bios of 750 LGBT amazing scientists, that run the board in all categories of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, from undergraduates all the way to deans of universities, please visit 500queerscientists.com or you can find us on social media at, at 500queerscientists. And thank you so much. <laughs>